Good evening. I'm Stu Levitan. Welcome to Madison in the 60s Book Bites. On behalf of the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, thank you for joining us. We'll talk a bit about the book. Madison in the 60s is a chronicle of the civic and political events that define the decade. It is not a social history, although it does touch on some entertainment highlights, including the details of how Madison was the last place Bob Dylan was before he went to New York for the first time. It's got a lot of facts and figures and dates and names and places, but it is not the encyclopedia of the 60s. And it is not an attempt to explain what the 60s meant to Madison or what Madison meant to the 60s. Because before we can talk about what it all meant, we have to establish what really happened. And this may come as a surprise, but there are a lot of myths and false memories about Madison in the 60s. And I wanted to get past all that and just chronicle the reality of those years. It is a very journalistic approach, which is appropriate because that's how I came to Madison as a young journalist in 1975. And the first research for this book was reading every page of every day's newspaper for the Capital Times, the State Journal, the Daily Cardinal, and the Badger Herald for the entire decade down at the Madison Public Library. And that was a lot of fun because there were fat newspapers with a lot of news and some really good reporters. I literally have thousands and thousands of individual items that are cropped and scanned and indexed, which I'm still making use of as material for a weekly feature I do for WORT News called, yes, Madison in the 60s, which the press has been kind enough to help underwrite and which the Milwaukee Press Club has honored two of the last three years as including the best writing for audio in the state of Wisconsin. And then after the newspapers, I had fun at the two great archives we've got in Madison, the University Archives and the Wisconsin Historical Society Archives, oral histories, government reports, photographic collections. The archives really are my happy place. Now, there are two things to know about my background in terms of possible conflicts before I talk about some of the substance. In addition to serving three terms on the Dane County Board of Supervisors in the early 1980s, I was fortunate enough to serve close to 40 years on several city boards and committees, including the Community Development Authority, the Plan Commission, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and lastly, the Landmarks Commission. Now, all of these feature in this narrative. And I'm also a friend or a friendly acquaintance of several of the politicians and activists and musicians who are featured in the book, most notably Paul Soglin, who gave me several of those appointments. I have to hope that those relationships helped me understand the events and the issues and did not compromise my intellectual integrity and independence. I leave it to the readers to decide how well I accomplished that. Now, despite the popular image, the 60s were about a lot more than just the anti-war protest. In a, because in fact, in addition to the issues that make news in every city, every decade, the public schools, highways and transportation, planning and development, crime and so on, there were four other issues that really dominated the decade in addition to anti-war protest. At one time or another, each of these issues was the most important issue in the city of Madison and dominated politics and government and often decided elections. And those four issues were the city's decades long attempt to build a public auditorium and, and convention center, urban renewal, civil rights, and the outsized effect of the University of Wisconsin on the city of Madison. I'm gonna talk in a little detail about two of those topics, but before I do, I wanna give you some before and after photos that I think convey how things changed during the decade. First, how we mourned our martyred heroes. On the left, the state's official memorial service for President Kennedy. On the right, the student-led memorial service for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Two very disparate civil rights actions, both on the library mall. On the left, a demonstration by a group almost exclusively white in support of the lunch counter sit-in movement at Southern chain stores. The demonstrators wanted to march up State Street, but held the rally instead when the Wisconsin Student Association opposed the march. 
needless to say, future generations of activists would not quite be so deferential to authority. And on the right, the start of the most successful political protest of the decade, the Black Studies strike, which aggressively blocked university buildings and University Avenue and achieved its primary goal of getting the university to establish a department of Afro-American studies. The impact of the baby boom on the university. In the lower left, the Southeast Dormitory Expansion Area in 1960. In the upper right, that same area just nine years later. 10 years in the life of Madison's melting pot as urban renewal wipes a legendary neighborhood off the map. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. And six years in the life of the anti-war movement. There were about 300 people on the steps of the Memorial Union in 1963. You can see the Historical Society in the background. And at that time, there were about 15,000 American troops, not yet called combat forces, in South Vietnam. Six years later, the same number of people poured into the UW Fieldhouse for an evening of speeches on Moratorium Day. And now I'm going to talk in detail about two particular topics. The first, as the decade opened, the most controversial public issue in Madison was whether to build a civic auditorium and convention center designed by Frank Lloyd Wright here at Law Park. It was named for Mayor James R. Law in the early 1930s at a time when he was still in office. They did that a lot back then and is one of the world's few waterfront surface parking lots. Now, how big an issue was this? It was big enough for a thousand people in a city of 126,000 to attend a six hour public hearing in the cramped auditorium of Central High School. And why did we need a public auditorium? Because when Eugene Ormandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra came to Madison, they were playing the stock pavilion and people thought that was not quite adequate. Frank Lloyd Wright proposed a combination convention center and entertainment and government complex at Law Park in 1938. Voters finally approved the concept and a $4 million budget in 1956, in 1954. Wright and the city agreed to a contract in 1956. In 1957, the Republican controlled legislature adopted height restrictions in order to kill the project. In 1959, the new democratically controlled legislature rescinded those restrictions and revived the project. And seven weeks before his death, Frank Lloyd Wright submitted this last iteration. This was actually put out to bid in 1961. That's how close we came to building the Frank Lloyd Wright Monona Terrace. But thanks to delaying tactics by a group that the fervently pro Monona Terrace Capital Times called the obstructionists. The budget was woefully too low, bids came in way too high, and were rejected. These are the men who caused those delays. Attorney and Republican legislator Carol Metzner, East Side publisher Marshall Brown, economic development activist Joe Jackson, and trucking company executive Henry Reynolds who ran for mayor in 1961 on a platform of killing Monona Terrace, was elected and pushed through a referendum in 1962 by which the people officially abandoned the project. The referendum itself was a piece of work. Reynolds forced the council to adopt language, which meant that if you supported Monona Terrace, you had to vote no. That's right, yes meant no and no meant yes. Now, Henry Reynolds not only fulfilled his campaign promise to kill Monona Terrace, he also built the Monona Causeway, built the Gay Braxton Apartments, the city's first public housing for the elderly displaced by urban renewal. He built the new Central Library and broke the tie to adopt the historic Equal Opportunities Ordinance with the first fair housing code in the state of Wisconsin. Now, I would never have voted for Henry Reynolds, but I have to acknowledge he was by far the most successful mayor of the decade. And here's an even more provocative, even heretical comment. In 
Henry Reynolds and the conservative businessmen who fought and killed Monona Terrace did us a favor. Their motives were undeniably bad. They opposed the project simply because they hated Frank Lloyd Wright, whom they considered to be a libertine deadbeat with suspect political views, all of which he was. But though their motives were bad, the result was good. And here's why. First of all, Law Park is in a very bad location for a performing arts venue. There simply aren't enough bars and restaurants in the immediate area, and it has very poor mass transit coverage. As a convention center, it would have failed with only 45% of the exhibition space in the Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center we finally did build and no meaningful way to expand. And finally, it would have had the same large and small theater and arts gallery as the Overture Center. If we had built this, I seriously doubt Jerry Frouchy would have given $200 million to replace it. Yes, it would have been very nice to have the prestige of an actual Frank Lloyd Wright design building all these years, but there is no question we are better served by the combination of Overture and the current Monona Terrace than we would have been by what Wright designed. And as you can see, the current Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center is certainly related to the original design. Now, there was another effort in the late 60s by Wright's son-in-law, William Wesley Peters. It was not as heavily politicized, but met the same fate as the construction budget did not satisfy the construction drawings and the project was abandoned. It would have been part of the Monona Basin Plan. This was a staggering statement of architectural ambition. Three miles of lakeshore development with cultural and recreation facilities in both Olin Park to the left and Law Park on the right. Alas, these plans were as far as that went. And after a final design went nowhere in 1969, the project would lay dormant until a new generation of political and business leaders would finally succeed in marrying the city and the lake. Now I'm going to talk a bit about urban renewal. Because the other dominant issue as the decade began was urban renewal, specifically the Madison Redevelopment Authority's destruction of 52 acres in the eastern tip of the greater Greenbush neighborhood, a 60 year old neighborhood that was international, intergenerational, interracial and interreligious, but unfortunately had inadequate infrastructure and so was turned into the triangle urban renewal area, which at the end of the decade looked like this. It is to the city's enduring shame how poorly the program was planned and executed, especially the disregard for this unique community that it was about to extinguish and the failure to provide affordable replacement housing when it was first needed in 1961 and 62 and 63. And remember, this was a time when there was no federal, state or local laws against housing discrimination. So finding new housing was especially difficult for the black residents of the bush. As this federal form makes clear and the highlighted boxes read available to non-white families, blacks had access to only a small fraction of housing units and no access at all to housing in many neighborhoods throughout the city which is why it was so important that Madison became the first city in Wisconsin to adopt a fair housing ordinance in December, 1963. Oh, and by the way, one of the chief drafters of that equal opportunities ordinance was a citizen member of the mayor's commission on human rights, future Supreme Court Chief Justice Shirley S. Abrahamson. That's another indication that Madison really is a special city. But here's another bit of heretical commentary as I try and advance the next image. Uh oh. Um, I do not think the city was acting out of. There we go. I do not think the city was acting out of ethnic, racial, or religious bias or to break up the neighborhood 
when it approved the urban renewal program in the late 1950s. I think the motive was generally benign and even well-intentioned. And here's why. A little bit of history. The area in red is the full Greenbush edition. It was platted in 1858. The area in yellow, what we now call the triangle, was marsh and landfill when it was platted in 1901, barely above the water table. By the late 1950s, its storm and sanitary sewers were just not built for modern standards, causing periodic flooding and other problems. There were problems with the streets. Park Street and West Washington Avenue were only 66 feet wide, hardly adequate for the amount of traffic in modern Madison, especially the approaches to the university and the state capitol. They needed to be expanded, and that required taking land through eminent domain. As to the neighborhood itself, 42% of the structures were substandard, and there were widespread uses which were wildly inappropriate and incompatible with residential life. Yes, it was great that there was Schwartz's Pharmacy and Troya's Market and the Kosher Butchers, but there were also six junkyards, a meatpacking plant, six taverns, and seven liquor outlets just in the neighborhood. Being able to walk to the grocery is good. Having to walk past junkyards and bars and feedlots every day, not so much. And no block shows the better these incompatible uses than the 700 block of Mound Street, that's the one running from the lower right to the upper left, and the adjoining frontage on Murray, that's to the left, and West Washington at the bottom. Now note the three starred buildings. The large white building is Neighborhood House, the most important secular building in the neighborhood and quite possibly in the entire city, especially for children. And you'll note that next to Neighborhood House is a tavern. The, star, the, star, the center star at the corner of Mound and Murray is the Adas Yesherin Synagogue. And the third star, right between the synagogue and the neighborhood house on the corner of Mound in West Washington is Gurky's Junkyard. A junkyard fronting on West Washington Avenue, seven blocks from the state capitol, next door to neighborhood house and a house of worship. This is a seriously incompatible land use, and it is not the only one. For the future of the neighborhood and the city, that junkyard and the others have to go. But without financing from the federal government and the power of eminent domain from the state, I wonder who's going to buy it. And that is not the old, this pattern repeats itself throughout the neighborhood. Every lot fronting on Regent Street is light commercial. Every lot fronting on Park Street is heavy commercial. West Washington has both. More, as you can see, there is not a single block in the entire neighborhood that is entirely residential. There is certainly no residential neighborhood in Madison today where every block has some light or heavy commercial use. When you consider the conditions on the ground in the late 1950s, I believe there's a persuasive case to be made for a full clearance project. I think the case gets even stronger when you project out from 1960 into the future and ask the question, if not a federally subsidized urban renewal project, then what? Where is the money going to come from to rehab those non-compliant properties or for new construction? Who's gonna buy and close the junkyard? Are we going to keep a street grid that is both inadequate and excessive? How is the city going to provide for and schedule the comprehensive and necessary infrastructure upgrade? This land, 52 acres, seven blocks from the Capitol, was simply too valuable to be left in its current use. And above all these quantifiable questions, there's an impressionistic one. Did the Bush even have a future as a cohesive ethnic community? Would the teenagers and children of, those, of that day who bemoan the loss of the neighborhood now, would they have stayed in the neighborhood and preserved the culture? Or would they have done what teenagers and young adults everywhere do when they grow up, move out, move away, and live their own lives? Yes, urban renewal eliminated an historic and unique neighborhood of groups which had historically been discriminated against. And yes, the Redevelopment Authority did a terrible job 
providing for replacement housing for the households displaced. And yes, the redevelopment authority cared more about public works than public community. But despite all that, I concluded that a comprehensive urban renewal project was justified. I know that a lot of people disagree. And here is how some of them expressed themselves back in the day. Among those hanging the redevelopment authority in effigy, the neighborhood's alder, himself a member of the MRA. And for those who believe that it was all just a scam for rich developers, here is how it all ended up prior to the Bayview Foundation's recent redevelopment now underway. Public housing for low-income elderly and handicapped, a project for moderate income, and medical facilities. Thank you. I hope you found that interesting, perhaps provocative. I am happy to take any questions or comments, which you do not have to limit to the topics I focused on. And again, thank you to the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, first for publishing Madison in the 60s, and then for giving me this opportunity uh, for this presentation tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm.